Hi everyone, um, I'm Elliot Higgins, founder of the website Bellingcat. Um, it's an investigative journalism uh, website that uses something we call open source and social media investigation. Um, this is actually quite a relatively new field. Whilst open sources have been used regularly in journalism, using social media um, to investigate various things is something quite new. So today I'm going to take you through um, what we do with the website and demonstrate that using uh, the case of MH17. So on Bellingcat, um, I set the website off af up after blogging for a couple of years. Um, and I wanted to bring together people who are doing the same kind of investigation. So on the website itself, we have um, work where we're looking at um, you know, all kinds of open source stuff, but we also have resources to teach people how to do this because we want as many people as possible doing this kind of work. Um, and the case of MH17 is a good example why it's so important. Oh. oh, there's a technical issue, unfortunately. Um, so I'll blab on for a minute. Um, so um, a bit more details about myself then. In 2012, I started a blog called the Brown Moses blog. Um, it was named after a nickname I'd been using online for a while, uh, named after a Frank Zappa song for anyone who cares. Um, and that was basically because I saw so much information being shared online in the Arab Spring countries that was being completely ignored. Um, because there were issues of verification, because there were um, issues of trust. And I wanted to figure out if we could actually learn anything from this stuff. So we started looking at different ways of um, doing this. So we use a methodology called geolocation um, to verify where things were actually taken. And this is a very basic step in the kind of work that we do um, at Bellingcat now. Um, hopefully, I'll soon be able to show you some examples um, from that. Um, some of the work I did on the Brown Moses blog initially um, examined, for example, the use of chemical weapons in Syria. I was the first person to write about the use of bow bombs. Um, and eventually, I launched Bellingcat. So what we have here, the clicker works. There we go. Um, I'm going to take you through now the case of MH17 as we discovered it using open source material. So um, this photograph here is one of the first photographs in the route of the Buck missile launcher we believe shot down MH17 on July 17th. It's in the separatist town, town of Donetsk. And you can see straight away there's an interesting detail there. There's a phone number. So um, when this photograph was first published, the phone number was called up. And the person who answered said the truck was theirs. They had a vehicle yard in the city um, and it had been overtaken by separatists. Um, and we can confirm that because we can actually Google the phone number and we can clearly see that it's um, on this website here. And um, we can actually zoom into the exact location of the address. And this is the vehicle yard in question and we can actually see the uh, phone number on the side of the building. And compare it side by side. So we had an idea where this uh, truck was coming from, but it wasn't until we had the second video, or uh, the first video showing it in a different location where we could actually figure out exactly where it was. Um, this was actually first shared on Twitter and they actually gave us coordinates, but you should never trust the coordinates you get on social media. And we can actually enter those coordinates and go to the exact location it's claimed to be filmed. And we can see here there's apartment buildings. There's details here we can start analyzing and matching. So, for example, we can see structures on top of the building. We can see other smaller structures on the ground. And we can even see the shadow being cast by this lamppost. And there's lots of details there that we can match and compare and confirm it's the same location. So we can confirm this was the location it was claimed to be. So we went back to the vehicle yard and we tried to figure out how can we actually figure out exactly where that photograph of that missile launcher on that truck with that number was taken. So what we did then is we used Google Street View and we um, figured out the fastest route between those two locations and basically went down the road using Google Street View. And that took us from this location to a location on the east edge of the city, um, heading out of the town. And 
if you look at this area, you'll notice you can see the shadows of some billboards there. And on Street View, you can actually see those specific billboards very clearly. So we took a closer look at this, and we want to match some of these, exact, these um, items in this photograph. So we're able to do this side-by-side -side comparison and compare um, the details. When you actually do this work, you find yourself drawing colored boxes around a lot of stuff to demonstrate the matches and images. So you'll probably see a few more colored boxes in this presentation. But all these elements matched in the photograph and the street view image. But more interestingly, the tree branches also were in pretty much the same position. So we can say confidently this is the exact spot where the photograph was taken. And as we were doing this work, journalists were going out to these areas and visiting them and confirming we had found the right location. So this is one example from the first photograph I showed you. And we also have this example where we can see the second the video we showed you. So we went from this location, from Donetsk in the west, to Zorus to the east, and then to the next image, which was taken in the town of Torres. Now, this is an interesting image because, um, again, we can see the missile launcher on the back of the truck. And our first clue to figuring out exactly where this was was this advertising hoarding on a shop. This was the name of the shop. And all we did is Google it and put the name of the town in along with it, which took us to this wiki. And this is a wiki that lists streets, street names of shops on in Ukraine. And now we have the name of the street as well and the name of the shop. So again, we go back, we Google that. That gives us this document, which is a court document where there was a fight in the shop, and the record was put online, and that gave us the full address of the shop. So that allowed us to find the exact location inside the town, which was just here. But that wasn't enough for us. We wanted more information. We wanted to be exactly sure where this was taken. So now I want you to take notice of this building, the yellow hoarding on this building, and this building with the two black and white stripes and that um, billboard down the middle of it. Because whilst we were Googling for this information and Googling for this address, we found a video by a guy who likes to drive around with his dash camera on, filming his drives. He then puts it on YouTube with the names of the streets he was on. So we had this video. So if you look on the left and the right, you can actually see those two buildings in this video. And here he's coming from a different direction. If you look on the right-hand side, that's where the camera is positioned in the photograph, pointing to the left-hand side, where you can see the building with the black and white stripes. It can also see the shop. So we now had video footage of that same location, again confirming exactly where that photograph had been taken. And again, journalists went out there. They filmed the same location and showed that we'd got the right spot. So um, there's something else in this image that gave us a bit more information. So if you um, notice, there's quite a few shadows in this image. And there's some platforms online that you can use to calculate the time of day based off this. SunCalc is a website. It's meant to be used by people like photographers who want to know when the shadow is going to be in a certain position so their photos aren't ruined. But we can reverse that and use the position of the shadows to tell the approximate time. So we're able to say that this was taking around 12.30. What we then did is we used um, route calculating software to see if the 11.40 time that we were given in Zores would fit with a time frame of around 12.30. And we could see that the journey time would have been about 35 minutes. Now, these are very rough calculations just to give us an idea of, you know, does this time frame work? Is this making sense? So we go from there. So we've, got, we've gone from Donetsk on the left to Zores in the middle to Torres. Now we had in the next location we had two photographs. We had sorry, we had one photograph and one video, and that was here. So on the left-hand side we have a photograph of the missile launcher that was taken, and on the right-hand side a video that was filmed. You'll notice now it's no longer on the truck; it's driving under its own power. So again, we geolocated the photograph, and we had people, local um, journalists, visit the area, take a photograph to show it's the same location. The video was a bit more interesting because um, there was a very distinct feature on this. In fact, with this one, 
what I did, I said, uh, I have quite a few followers on Twitter who love doing these kind of, uh, solving these kind of puzzles, and I just asked them to try and find it on my behalf. I said they'd get a gold star if they found it first. Um, so we start from where the photograph was taken, and we move to the east, and we can see two lanes with trees running down the middle of it, as we can see in the video. And a number of people pointed me to this location, so I went through to verify what they were finding. So you can see this road runs at south out of the town. And what was interesting is there's this building on the east, hand, east side of the road that has this red roof, very distinct. And in fact, you can actually see that in the video. What you can also see, if you follow the pathway, uh, the road to the west, you can see there's a road there. To the south, there's a tree. And just south of that, there's another road running to the east. If you watch the video again, we can actually see that here. We can see the two roads. We can see the tr tree in between them. These are just some examples of what you can find in this video that matches. What you can also see is this video is filmed from up high. So it must be they're either in a helicopter, which seems unlikely, or they're on top of a tall structure. So if we watch this video, we can go to the top of the road. And there we can see some apartment buildings. And we can actually place the camera to give us a view of what that might look like from those apartment buildings. And we can compare that side by side with the video to get a good idea of what it looks like. So as you can see, the view is quite similar. And this was the last sighting of the missile launcher on video or photograph on that day. So we started in Donetsk. We traveled through Zores, Torres, and finally to the east, where we finally seen it driving south out of town on this road. But we also had social media posts that were being made by people as they saw the missile launcher driving through the territory. Um, this is one of the most interesting ones. This is the first report we have of the missile launcher. Here, they're talking about it following a route into Donetsk. So this is when they were first entering the city before they left. So that tells us this missile launcher wasn't just sat there overnight. It just arrived that morning. But it also tells us something else that's interesting. It talks about a convoy the, ve the vehicle was in with a grey RAV4 SUV, a camouflage UAZ, which is like a Jeep, and a dark blue Hyundai van. Now, that's interesting because when we actually look at the photographs, we can actually see, first of all, this is the route it came into the town with. So it's coming down this road, and it goes to the location where we found the first photograph here. So you can see on the left-hand side there's a vehicle, and we can zoom into that, um, and that is a back end of the RAV4 that was mentioned in the social media posts from um, earlier that morning. Here, we can actually see a UAZ vehicle as well, right behind it. And what's interesting is there's a video from two days beforehand showing a convoy of vehicles accompanying some tanks into Donetsk. And these are the vehicles in question. And they appear to be the same vehicles that were in the July 17th convoy. So now we've got two convoys with the same group of vehicles. So here's the RAV4, again in the same convoy on July 15th with some tanks. And you can get this spoiler on the end, of the back of it, is actually a uh, custom job. So that's another unique identifier. There was a new video actually released recently showing the uh, missile launcher um, going through separatist-held territory. And we can actually see the same vehicles from the June, June, sorry, July 15th convoy are in the June 7, uh, July 17th convoy with the missile launcher. So now we've got something very interesting. We really want to know who owns these vehicles. We've already looked at the number plates, and they're all fake. We had an investigator in UK who looked into the number plates and said they'd been cloned off of the vehicles. So these vehicles are very interesting, not only to us, but obviously to the criminal investigation. Um, we also had um, satellite imagery Stratfor uh, published from July 17th, around 11 o'clock in the morning, that shows the actual low loader carrying that Buck missile launcher on the satellite imagery as it's heading out of Donetsk. So we have this now, we have this route that we've established, but 
We also have this image. This was shared online on social media, showing a column of smoke rising from the ground, um, claiming to show the, just after the missile had been launched. This was actually an enhanced photograph. The original photograph was actually much darker, and there's actually two of them. A second photograph, which you can see here, um, you can see how dark it is. You can just make out the white smoke. So what we did, we used geolocation again. We managed to find the exact apartment building the photograph had been taken from. Because we knew the position of the camera, we could also see where the position of the smoke was. So we followed that smoke back to um, this field, which after July 17th had been plowed up. And just to the north, you'll see the last location where we saw the missile launcher coming out of the town. So those are pretty close locations, so that was very interesting to us. In fact, only two hours ago, Google Earth updated the imagery from July 16th of that same field, which shows that it was um, completely untouched on July 16th. So this happened sometime after July 16th. Um, this is the preview imagery that shows it untouched, but this is now on Google Earth, so you can look it up yourself if you want. Um, and what we also had was this image. This was supplied by the US government. It was published. It was widely ignored because that's a really terrible image. You look at that and you don't know what's going on. There's a bunch of gray blurs with a colored line coming out of it. It's really bad quality. It took us a few months to figure out where that line was coming from. And the way we did that is we managed to identify lakes and other landmarks we could use to get the exact position. And that position just happened to point to right next to the field that we identified from the smoke. So that was another piece of evidence that suggested this was the launch site. We also had a lot of social media posts by locals discussing what they'd seen um, on the day. Those who were talking about locations for a missile launch all pointed in the direction of that same field. And there's been journalists who've gone out there. They spoke to the local farmer who owns the field, and he said his field was on fire on July 17 for some reason. So it seems that the launch had set the field on fire and then it had been plowed out because of the damage to the field. So the next day, um, this video was shared by the Ukrainian uh, Ministry of Interior. This shows the same truck again we saw on July 17th with a Buck missile launch on it. Um, but this time, one of the missiles is missing. And we can see it's the same missile with the same truck from before. Um, when they phoned up the number on the um, side of the truck, the owner said, my truck is unique. It's got a unique paint job. And when you get a clear view of that truck in other images, you can actually see there's various logos that are on the truck as well. So this sighting, um, according to the Ukrainian Ministry of Interior, was on the way out of uh, Ukraine, going through Krasnodon on the bottom right-hand side. They were saying on a road through to Krasnodon, and this caused a lot of confusion because the actual location it was filmed is here in Luhansk. Eventually, they did publish the exact coordinates, and we can confirm this is true. So what we're able to do here is look at the traffic cameras for the local area. Now, these traffic cameras have been turned off the, day, uh, the week before, so we couldn't get any recent imagery. But what they didn't do is turn off the preview imagery. So we were able to look in the code of the website and get this image that shows the same location where this missile launcher uh, supposedly traveled through. And this gave us some details of the local area, um, including this billboard. And you can see the billboard seems to have the same advert on it. And of course, billboards aren't unique. You have lots of billboards with the same adverts on, so that's not solid evidence. What was also interesting is on the top of the picture, to the right of the church, there's these buildings with red roofs on them. Um, this image is from Yandex Map Street View. There's a Russian version of Google, you could say, and they have their own version of Street View. And this shows those buildings in the background, and this is in the position the camera in the film would have been. And we can take an even closer look at that, and we can see we've got the red roof, we've got the silver chimney, the silver roof on the left-hand side, and then the white brick building with the silver roof on the right-hand side. And there are other details there that match, but this is more confirmation it's the same location. I also noted in the first frame of the video, there's a window frame, and it's overlooking some trees. So again, we have to see where the vantage point of the camera is. And if we actually look at the crossing, we can see there's apartment buildings there overlooking the crossing over some trees. So this is the likely location where this was actually filmed from. 
then locals started posting photographs of LiveJournal of the same location. They went out, visited there, started taking photographs. Um, so for example, there was this lamp pole there. And we can see the same lamp pole in the video. And even though the quality isn't very good, we can see the furniture on that lamp post is identical. We can also compare the curb and see if the curb's also the same, which it is. Um, and also the sign, the advert is exactly the same. So by this point, I'm pretty confident it's the same location. Now, as we were um, looking into this, people all over the internet were looking for videos of Buck missile launchers. And they came across videos like this. And this is a convoy in Russia um, in June, between June 23rd and June 25th. And there were lots of videos of this convoy. But one of the vehicles in it was very interesting. Because when we compared the markings on the vehicle to the markings visible in the uh, Donetsk photograph, we noticed there was something very interesting about it. So this is the video we created comparing the markings and other features. So first of all, we can see, although the numbers have been painted over, the remaining paint is in the same location, which is fairly unusual. We also have these other markings that are also in the same location. These are loading markings. They aren't always painted in the same place. A burn mark on the exhaust at the same place. And the most interesting part was this rubber skirt they have along the top of the tracks. Now, we realized by comparing lots of different missile launchers, those rubber skirts are like fingerprints. They get damaged over time, and they create a unique pattern of damage. So you'll notice here they're virtually identical, apart from one very clear discrepancy here. Now, there's two reasons for that. Either that it was a different vehicle, or there was a significant amount of three-dimensional damage that wasn't being adjusted for when we flagged in the image. So we searched for more images, and we found this image where we could actually see the significant amount of damage on the skirt. So we built up more and more information linking these two missile launches. This missile launch in Russia appeared to be the same one we saw on July 17, 2014. And we went through every single photograph and video of missile launches we could ha find doing that comparison, testing that out. And this is just a small selection, but none of them matched apart from the one missile launcher we called 3X2 in Russia and the missile launcher that we saw on July 17th in Ukraine, the MH17 bug. And what we had were more videos like this, where we had the missile launchers traveling through Russia. And we used this to geolocate each video. We went through, we geolocated each video. And based off that, we were able to find the exact route the convoy took. And we could map it out every single point. We know the exact location it was between June 23rd and June 25th. We documented all the vehicles in it. And then the question was, where did this come from? Where was this convoy originating from? So we noticed something. There were number plates on a lot of these vehicles, and they all ended with 50. And now 50 designates the Moscow military region. In the Moscow military region, there's only one air defense battalion with Buck missile launchers, the 53rd Air Defense Brigade. We went to the social media page of the 53rd Air Defense Brigade, and that was followed by lots of soldiers from the 53rd Air Defense Brigade. And we looked at their social media profiles, and we find guys like this, posting pictures from his time in service. And this guy used to work in the same truck we've seen, and he took a photograph of it. And you can see there it's the same truck with the same number plate in the 53rd Air Defense Brigade. So now we had an idea where this truck was coming from. Other members of his unit also posted pictures like this. It's their attendance record, um, their attendance log, with all the members of their unit in it. So what we were able to do there is basically search for all the members of the units and start building up this network of social media profiles of all the soldiers in this unit. So they would post pictures like this, where they would helpfully tag all their friends in the unit, so we could have an even better idea who was in the unit. Some of them even took photographs of themselves in the convoy we were tracking, so we could confirm those individuals were in that convoy. In this photograph, um, you see the guy behind the two guys, he's fast asleep. He's actually visible in one of the videos of the convoy sleeping as well. So we're able to match those three guys to the convoy. So we know all these guys were in the convoy that was transporting the missile launcher that we believe shot down MH17 to Ukraine. Um, hopefully, when they arrived at the border, they started taking photographs of themselves with the local um, town sign as well, so we can confirm exactly where they were.
We had their um, wives and their mothers and their girlfriends posting on forums about what they were doing, saying how worried they were about their husbands and boyfriends going off to uh, the Ukrainian border. So based on that, we were able to reconstruct every single member of the second division of the 53rd Air Defense Brigade who was in that convoy taking that missile launcher to the border with Ukraine. So we've got the commanders at the top, and all the way at the bottom, we have the individuals who were driving the, uh, who were in charge of the individual military units in that convoy. So we can't be sure if any of these are the person who actually shot down MH17, but what we can say is they were part of a military unit that moved to the border that had the missile launcher that shot down MH17 in it, and that it's a pretty fair chance they no noticed that missile launcher disappeared one day in July. So um, this is information we passed to the Dutch, uh, the joint investigation team, um, and uh, that's something they're looking into at the moment. Now, there's two sides to every story, um, and the Russian had their own versions of it, defense. On July 21st, 2014, they gave a massive press conference where they presented their own evidence. Now here, this is the video from Lahansk I showed you earlier that the, Russian, the Ukrainian Ministry, Ministry of Interior published online. And they're saying that this um, video was actually filmed in government-held territory because the billboard has an address on it that is in government-held territory. But we've already found this video was filmed in separatist-held Lahansk. So um, the question is, where are they getting these ideas from? Because we can see here a comparison between what was actually on the billboard and what the Russians claimed was on the billboard, which you can see is completely different. So this is one of the four claims they made that we've already established is untrue. In fact, one interesting thing is when um, Corrective TV went to find this billboard after we published this information, there's a very specific piece of vandalism on the billboard. Um, later on, Billy Six, a German um, freelancer, went to the same billboard, even more heavily damaged, and as you can see here, and he also took a look at that chimney, which had somehow got bent over in the meantime. So, um, yeah, that's odd that that would happen, very specific damage from the weather. He also went to the uh, car showroom that the Russians claimed was on that billboard. And as you can see there, there's the uh, showroom number. You can see it's the same address. And he went inside and met the owner, who says he's never put a billboard up in his life. It's a central office thing, and it wouldn't have his address on it anyway. Um, but he says he also met the person who filmed the video, um, but couldn't get enough information before he was bundled away by the uh, nephew of this uh, old woman who had filmed it. Now, this is a second piece of um, evidence the Russians presented. What they're claiming here is here, that's the flight path of MH17. This is the air corridor. And MH17 was ordered to turn out and make a turn, pulling it into the danger zone. But we can actually test that because the Dutch Safety Board published um, the fl actual flight path based off radar and flight data. And what you can see here is the... Um, Russian MOD flight path marked out quite clearly. And this is the map from the Dutch safety board which you overlaid. And this is the route according to the Dutch safety board. As you can see, it's completely different. And this is Russia, four days after MH17 has been shot down, 298 people de dead, caught lying for a second time in their press conference, lying about the flight path of MH17. Here we have radar data presented by the Russian Ministry of Defense. Um, unsurprisingly, this radar data stops after that huge turn they claim happened. And what they're claiming here is um, shortly after MH17 was shot down, um, two objects appeared on the radar from one. And they were claiming this second object, one was MH17, and the second was a jet fighter nearby. Now, the Dutch Safety Board says that's untrue. The Dutch Safety Board says that's MH17 breaking in two. Radar experts consulted by various media organizations say it's MH17 breaking in two. So uh, again, the Russian Ministry of Defense appears to be lying 
about MH17 evidence four days after it's been shot down. So that's line number three. Now, um, this next one is one of the more interesting ones. This is satellite um, imagery the Russian Ministry of Defense presented. They claim this is a uh, Ukrainian air defense base. And this is from July 14th. And this is from July 17th. And the point they were making is the Buck missile launcher, which you can see parked here, along with three vehicles here, had disappeared on July 17th. Now, um, we wanted to check that, so we crowdfunded the purchase of satellite imagery. You can buy this stuff from Digital Globe, which is a satellite imagery provider. And it just happened they had an image from 11 o'clock on July 17th which was about within 30 minutes of the claimed time the Russian imagery was taken on July 17th. So here's the actual image from July 17th. And we can compare it with the Russian imagery. Now, we can see there the Buck missile launcher and those three vehicles are set, still there. Now, maybe 30 minutes after the right-hand image was taken, those vehicles drove off, and that's when the Russians got their image. Maybe. But there's other details in there we can look at. So up on this top left-hand corner, there's a vehicle yard. What we can see on the right-hand side are the vehicles as they were on July 17th. And on the left-hand side, how they are in the Russian MOD imagery. Again, vehicles move. Um, but what's interesting is in the several images there are on Google Earth of July, those vehicles never move. They're always in the same position, and it's not the same position as the Russian Ministry of Defense imagery. What we can see in this May image and this June image is they are in the same position as the Russian MOD imagery. So that's a little odd. And next we have this in the top left-hand corner. A group of uh, bushes and trees with a path cut through them. This is Russia saying this is from July 14th. July 17th, according to the Digital Globe, those trees are gone. And if we look at July... 2nd and July 21st, those trees are still gone. So how on earth could they be in an image from Russia if it's dated from July 14th? So that's very suspicious, I think you'll agree. Um, this is an image from the start of um, the end of May where you can see the trees are still there and they haven't been cut through. And that gives them an extra bit of dating information. That cut hasn't been made on May 30th. So now we know the Russian MOD imagery must be before July 2nd and it must be after uh, May 30th. And we can see this image from June 16th that also shows uh, the cut through. So we know that cut was made sometime in June. Finally, the last bit of dating information, we can see on the Russian MOD imagery from July 14th and July 17th, this area of worn away grass. Pretty much identical in both images apart from the uh, contrast. But again, we look at the July 17th imagery and it's simply not there. But if we look at this Mar May 30th image, we can actually see it's there. And it's absolutely identical. There's no way the Russian MOG images, images are from any time in July. So four pieces of evidence they presented in the July 21st press conference, all of them are provable lies using open source information. Now, we know this was given to the Dutch Safety Board. This satellite imagery was given to the Dutch Safety Board. Seems pretty likely they gave it to the joint investigation team, the criminal investigation into MH17. So it would seem that Russia has given fake evidence to a murder inquiry, which is obviously an issue. So um, that's my presentation. Um, so uh, we can have a Q&A now. I'll preempt a couple of questions. Um, we're doing a report in July that's going to summarize a lot of the open source evidence we have. We often have people saying, well, you know, you're no experts, what do you know? So we've gone and asked experts in forensic uh, analysis to look at all the evidence this time around, and that will be part of that re report. Um, and, uh, okay, any questions? Yeah. All right. A round of applause for Elliot, please. Thank you. You can join me right over here. We've got the catch box ready if anyone has any questions that they want to kick things off with. All right, I'm going to toss it out here first, and then you can pass it to this gentleman behind you next. Hi, 
um, maybe I missed the very beginning, but can you just say what made you start this investigation? Um, I mean, before that, I'd been working on um, mainly Syria, and people had kind of got to know my working, you know, open source investigation. And when MH17 was shot down, um, quite a few of my followers on social media just asked me to look at the videos, and uh, that's how we started. And then, because there was quite quickly an obvious disagreement between Russia and the rest of the world about who did what, and as I showed you, some of the evidence seems a bit off, it just made it more and more interesting. So, um, you know, over the last two years, there's been many claims and counterclaims made, and it just makes the whole investigation more interesting, because, I mean, we've looked at every scrap of information we can find. The 53rd Brigade investigation took us about a year to do to find all that information, so um, it's kept us busy, and we find it very interesting. Awesome. We've got another question here. Um, the question is, do you also keep records of everything you look at. If you look at Google Maps, yeah. uh, that's the situation if, uh, if, uh, when you look at it. And do you make a sort of like a video movie of what you investigate? Because that can also change. Yeah. Um, we generally, if we find anything on the internet, we use an archiving website and save it offline. Um, because we want to, the archiving website means there's a copy that's independent of our interaction with it. Um, and we have an offline copy just in case the archive copy disappears. So when we were doing the uh, 53rd Brigade investigation, because it was social media profiles of people who probably didn't want to be exposed like that, we kept quiet and archived everything quietly in the background. Um, there's actually a new um, Chrome plugin, uh, unfortunately not free, but it's called Hunchly. And what that does, it automatically archives all the pages you're looking at as you're doing research. So that makes life a lot easier, because we were doing it by hand, and that is time consuming. Well, uh, first, uh, a very big compliment for your tedious work. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's really, uh, I can imagine all the work you've put into it, so my compliments. Um, do, you, uh, do you feel appreciated by the, the uh, joint uh, uh, criminal boards which are researching this tragedy? Yeah, I mean, they've taken an interest in our work. Um, I've been interviewed um, twice. The lead on the 53rd Brigade investigation was interviewed as well. Um, and they've been very meticulous about going through the work with us. Um, they seem very interested in the process as much as the evidence. So um, that's been very good. And we continue to stay in touch with them when we find more information. Okay. Any other questions here? Now that you're making these tools available, what, what's your hope for what it can become? Well, um, I'm currently trying to expand Bellingcat because currently we're mainly volunteers. I'm trying to get funding to make it a large organization. But what we're already doing is sending out um, you know, the trainers to go to media organizations and train them in the same kind of investigation, as well as supporting ongoing investigations that need that kind of social media and open source analysis that we're doing. So it's really about um, increasing the number of people who are doing this kind of work. Excellent, excellent. Do we have any more in the crowd? If we can make the box make its way around. OK. Thank you very, very much, Elliot, again, for your hard work and for all your dedication to making this happen. And